Um, I'm quite excited uh, to have this panel tonight. So hopefully you all find it as interesting as I do, but I'm um, excited to moderate this because uh, of the four people that we have here today. I think all of them are doing incredible work uh, on this topic and, and have a lot to say about it. Uh, before we start, I do want to thank um, those that have made this possible. Um, that would be uh, the Department of Social, uh, the Social Sciences Department here at the University of Michigan Dearborn. I should introduce myself, as I always forget. My name is Josh Akers. I am an assistant professor in the Social Sciences Department here. Uh, the Urban and Regional Studies Program. Uh, Director Laura Roosh is here today, uh, tonight. And then finally, this is the uh, first event uh, that the Detroit School has had on the UM Dearborn campus. And we are excited uh, that they chose to have an event here or have been willing to coordinate an event here with us. Uh, and they would, um, and that is, uh, so our special thanks to Alexa Eisenberg, uh, Rob Pfaff, and Lydia Wilden. Uh, but they also wanted to make an announcement, so. It wouldn't be a Detroit School event without a quick plug. Um, so I'm Alexa Eisenberg. Thanks again for being here. We host a series of, of lectures and panels throughout the year. Um, so if this is your first exposure to that, we just invite you to um, check us out on Facebook or visit our website. And you can also email DetroitSchool at umich.edu to start getting um, emails for all of our events. And then we have an upcoming lecture on December 6th, which is a Thursday, from 4 to 6 p.m. on the Ann Arbor campus. Um, and that's going to be with Brian Doucette from the University of Waterloo, who's going to have, um, it, we're going to talk about his, his book and sort of his work's relevance to international scholars. So I invite you all to attend. And really looking forward to this panel. Thank you. All right. Um, so. I'm going to quickly introduce the panelists. I'll let them describe themselves and their work a little bit more. Um, and then I'm going to take a couple of minutes to kind of put this uh, issue in context, I think, through an anecdote and, and hopefully um, drive a bit of the conversation. Uh, so we have Wade Rathke. He's the um, founder of ACORN, the head of ACORN International, uh, and the chief organizer for the Home Savers Campaign, which is organizing contract buyers in cities uh, throughout the United States. Christine McDonald who is a reporter for the Detroit News and has been covering issues of housing for I, a while. <laughs> I'm, uh, Ali Gross, uh, of the Detroit Free Press, and Eric Seymour, who's a uh, postdoc in the Population Studies Center uh, at Brown, um, and uh, my colleague and, and co-author on, on quite a bit of work. So the title of the panel today is Post-Crisis Housing Markings and Housing Insecurity. Um, and there's a lot of, I want to kind of lay out broader contours and challenges of these um, low-income housing markets, rising housing insecurity that we see today, and the very real impacts these changes have on families in cities across the U.S., and particularly in Detroit. Um, and I think that's kind of the key focus, or at least where I'd like to keep part of the conversation at, is the actual impacts on, on people. So we can run a lot of numbers out here, but um, I think the people here today are about that component. Um, so the anecdote I want to tell you illustrates both the costs of predatory real estate practices on families, the impacts of housing, insecurity, and the challenges of addressing these issues. So a few months ago, uh, a woman I'll call Ms. Gomez uh, came to Detroit Eviction Defense, uh, a Detroit Eviction Defense meeting seeking assistance. Uh, she did put down a $2,000 deposit on a rental house in southwest Detroit. Um, at the time, she was desperate to find housing for her family, which included her daughter, her daughter's boyfriend and, their f and her five grandchildren. Uh, and they were trying to get in before, uh, before the start of the school year. Uh, she was desperate. The house was in need of a lot of repairs. These repairs included a hot water heater and a furnace. And the pro property manager promised that these would be completed after they moved in. And there would be a furnace by the fall. For Ms. Gomez, who's disabled, this was a significant amount of money, uh, particularly for a house that needs work. But as she put it, she was desperate. She didn't, um, she didn't drive, and she needed to be close to her grandson's school. They'd worked hard to get him in. Uh, the conditions of the house were a lot worse uh, than she knew. The plumbing was incomplete, and the toilet emptied directly into the basement. Uh, so this quickly developed into a river of raw sewage. The washer and dryer, essential for a family of eight, was located in the basement. 
The light switches and electrical outlets did not have covers, and they had exposed wires, and they would shock whenever the lights were turned on or off. The repairs were never made, and the furnace and hot water heater never installed. The need to boil water for bathing led to an explosion of black mold on the walls and ceiling. The property manager provided space heaters when the weather turned cold. The second night, the Gomez family awoke to the alarm of a carbon monoxide sensor. The space heaters intended to keep them warm would have killed them without the alarm. The property now, manager now claims she's a squatter and he's threatening eviction. They also claim they'd called Child Protective Services and the agents were looking for her. Uh, throughout the ordeal, the property manager has continued to advertise the property on Craigslist and Zillow for cash sale land contract, uh, or a land contract, which is often another predatory activity. For Ms. Gomez, the issue is finding a new place to live and getting back her deposit. She needs the deposit to afford a new place to live. But finding available rental housing in a livable condition for eight people in the same area of the city has been difficult. Many landlords have refused to rent because of the number of children. Many tell her they'll get back to her or after hearing the number of children put her on hold only to return and say the property has already been rented. Though the size of Mrs. Gomez's family is a factor, the details of her case and experience are not unique in Detroit or in cities uh, across the United States. There are over 19 million families in the U.S. that are considered housing insecure. This means their housing costs exceed one third of their income. They're in substandard housing like Mrs. Gomez that could, be, that prob could and probably should be condemned or they've moved multiple times within a year. Beyond insecurity, nearly 3,000 people are in emergency shelters or on the streets in Detroit every night. Government programs to divide, provide some forms of affordable housing and a safety net are increasingly in jeopardy or inadequate to meet demand. The U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development has proposed massive rent e increases for low-income residents. The most recent HUD budget proposed zero dollars for maintenance and repair of public housing and hundreds of local housing agencies in cities across the U.S. have applied to HUD's RAD program, began under the Obama administration, that redevelops public housing as public-private partnerships with fewer units. The kinds of activities Mrs. Gomez experienced and the actions of her landlord are increasingly common in the aftermath of the financial crisis. There's a growing body of research that traces home ownership patterns and how they've changed following the mortgage and financial crisis a decade ago. The rise of bulk buyers of both mortgage foreclosed properties and in the case of Detroit in particular tax foreclosed properties has led to landlords with a large repertoire of exploitative practices that generate huge profits. The result is a rise in evictions and increasing costs for public demolition. These economies of displacement are disproportionately experienced by people of color. The use of land contracts like the one Mrs. Gomez's landlord was trying to lure another buyer in are with increasingly common in low-income communities of color and are directly tied to the rising eviction rates and housing instability in cities. The crisis of the last decades, um, the crisis of the last decade was a restructuring of low-income housing markets. Precarity has always been part of these markets, but eviction is increasingly a tool to profit rather than merely displace. This might be a bit of whiplash for Wade, whose organization was at the forefront of organizing against these contracts in the 60s and the 70s, and is now involved with the Home Savers campaign. And outside of those experiencing these conditions, Christine and Allie are in the middle of this transition, investigating and reporting on not only the conditions and challenges residents face, but the activities of investors and speculators, and how policymakers are trying to grapple with or ignore the plight of their constituents. Uh, for Eric and myself, we've been trying to figure out how these, how these property pipelines work, where they come from, the kinds of tools that these landlords use, and their actual relationship to these evictions and processes. So with that, I want to, with that, bringing the room up, I want to turn it over to these panelists who have all, are all doing the hard work of trying to change or at least bring to our attention the conditions that people face. So I think to start, I guess I will come to Wade, since you sat there at the table, to maybe think about it. I thought I was sitting the farthest <laughs> away. <laughs> That's just, yes, yeah. I'd like to flip things over. But I think, it, I think it's important in thinking about both um, the campaign that you have that's going on now and how you came to that campaign, um, and maybe how that differs or 
how it's informed by, by past, uh, past experiences. Okay, so the cliff notes I got to prepare said to talk about the challenges of organizing in this climate of housing now and historically. And so in listening to Josh's introduction, where he goes through the challenge is that there are huge numbers of families facing a precarious housing situation in the country that isn't even fully revealed by those numbers. Um, we all know there was a meltdown in housing in 2007, 2000, that began in 2007 and certainly reached, uh, you know, attention in 2008. Uh, millions of homes were foreclosed. Uh, building of adequate affordable housing had slowed down before that time and, and came virtually to a halt after that time. Um, historically, uh, and part of the, the context of all of this is that uh, housing discrimination, affordable housing, uh, housing particularly for low to moderate income families, and that's what ACORN has always organized, has always been a difficult proposition. And ACORN was founded in 1970 in Little Rock, Arkansas, and even at that time, we would run into people on the doors who were on contracts for deed because until 1975, the Federal Housing Administration had a policy of deliberately redlining communities, which often meant, particularly in the South and in major urban areas where there had been significant African-American migration, it was legal to redline and therefore FHA would not take over a mortgage in certain communities. In those communities, if you wanted to own a house physically, have a deed, you often had to sign a contract for deed. The housing market was tight at that time, so even on the doors in 1970 and 71, we were running into people on their second and third contract trying to own sometimes the same house. You got sick, you lost your job, you missed payments for a month, you were out. You had no equity, you started over. In 1977, with the passage of the Community Reinvestment Act, which ACORN and many other groups worked to pass, and its accompanying legislation in the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, finally gave both a legal uh, regime to challenge banking practices that overtly discriminated because you could block purchase of additional banks, opening of branches, anything that opened the CRA window allowed us to challenge bank practices. So two of the first three challenges that were heard by the Federal Reserve were one from Boatman's Bank in St. Louis on a, a particularly egregious set of uh, discriminatory practices in that, st in that market in St. Louis and the second Hibernia Bank in New Orleans. Over the last 40 years though, that Community Reinvestment Act has steadily been diluted, so many of its protections don't exist in the same way. And certainly 10 years ago at the financial crisis, what that meant is when you had all these homes come up in foreclosures and go to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, many companies, including hedge funds, Wall Street funds, and some uh, bottom fishing real estate operations bought tranches of these homes, 10,000 here, 5,000 there, 20,000 there, and brought back some of these same uh, predatory instruments to flip them from their ownership to others. So uh, contract for deeds were a little bit more difficult to revive because Dodd-Frank legislation took jurisdiction over contract for deeds. So a company like Harbor Portfolio, which uh, for a while was uh, trumpeting on the pages of the Wall Street Journal and elsewhere that it was going to use contract deeds to get rid of these houses, um, is now trying for the last year and a half to try to get out of those contracts because they're under scrutiny. Other companies use rent to own, uh, a very novel one by one of the larger companies, Vision Property Management, was lease purchase option lease the home for seven years once you finally read the documents and at the end of those seven years you would have the option to buy and doing hitting the doors in seven or eight cities including Detroit of people who were 
had agreements with Vision Property Management. We only found three people who ever understood that they didn't own the house after seven years. So one of our sort of volunteer team said, you know, geez, wait, I feel like we're the angel of death. We're going to, you know, hey, you know, do you realize you really don't own this house in seven years? And some people would argue with us and they'd find the pay. And unfortunately, that was the situation. But we were surprised, and I think that's the second part of the question, I don't know if it's this part, that historically when we were involved in housing fights and people wanted to own their homes, they were driven to home ownership. That was the problem with the original predatory nature of contract for deeds and the red line times. People wanted to own a home. The first reactions when we were first hitting the doors in Philly and Pittsburgh was that people would turn to us and say, should we walk away? And this was after putting down a down payment, putting in equity to try to fix. These all were as-is contracts. They all, I mean, the only thing that surprised me about Eric's story was somehow they had a carbon monoxide monitor. Yeah, yeah that just never happens. So that was pure luck. Um, pure luck. So most of these houses, some of them didn't have plumbing, some of them were stripped, no wiring, but you took them over for that contract. What we found increasingly is that people thought, well, maybe we'll own the house, but they were really being driven in. We did a survey of uh, almost 100 families, and it turned out that inordinately, people were in these houses either because of family size, as Eric has mentioned, or just desperation. They'd been evicted. Um, they had to have some place to go. These housing models routinely, as a matter of, of marketing, price the rent to own or lease purchase at 10 to 20 percent lower than market rent. So if you're desperate for money and market rent is $800 and they're only charging $650 and you only have $500, well, $650 looks like a good deal and you sign the agreement and, okay, well, you know. So we were finding that this was just part of the the bleeding hard edge of the housing crisis for rental, affordable, decent rental properties, and it happened to be used in foreclosure situations for ownership. And that's part of what drove us in this campaign. Um, Back to you. No, yeah, I mean, based on that, I mean, even from what you're <laughs> saying. Debbie Downer, and, you know, with the yeah, happy I'm, news just keeps coming. It's my job. <laughs> yeah, that's all of our jobs. I, I wanted to jump small to Small point on that. Yeah. I think, you know, you talk about the desperation, and yes, you do see that. But there, I did see, you know, in reporting, maybe not so currently, but that idea that people want still to own their own home. It's Absolutely. that American dream. So I don't want to rent anymore. I want to, and everyone's buying at the tax sale. So I want to, I want to get in on this. And so then they're just totally overwhelmed. They, they you know, unprepared to read those documents and then, but that motivation, you know, to, to own their own home still is the... We just didn't driver. find it in more than 15% of the cases. Really? Okay. Yeah. That they yeah, some articulated people, that? Yeah, yeah. some people okay. did articulate that as the first reason, but in many cases it was yeah. the horrors of daily life. More, right. You know, yeah. sort of pushing that more to the bottom. It'd yeah, be nice. It'd be nice if they, you know, yeah. know it's more like, hey, well, oh, you know, that'd be good. In Detroit, we had, you know, the biggest tax sale in the nation that went on, you know, that's gone on for years here. And I think that is the, you know, the um, uh, motivator for a lot of people. I don't want to rent anymore. You know, I want to try to get in on this and then, or do do through a third party because it is still very hard to, to uh, buy directly for regular Joe. You know, you're doing it online. You've got to make a deposit. Can't remember how much it is, but it's fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred, yeah. yeah. Mm. And you have to navigate that system and and know where to go. So it's really designed, you know, it's just a list in Excel file um, of properties. So it's really designed for those savvy investors who can map those out, you know, and have data and be able to, you know, where that where are the ones we want to get, you know, and um, but not a regular Joe. It's going to be very difficult you know mm -hmm. for them you, you see a lot of folks and i know ali's seen it probably too but at registered deeds they have a public terminal down at uh greek town that's where you you know the registered deeds and the treasure is and that's where a lot of people you find just folks searching the ownership history on those public terminals and trying to figure out you know but it so yeah 
And of course, you can't have any bad tax liabilities or water bills or anything else, or you're not qualified to participate in the participate. Land Well, allegedly. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's their signs the are all over right. there. Yeah. That's the rule, but uh, the staff, I mean, has, the, of the treasurer's office has pretty much acknowledged that they don't do that. You know, you can't have blight fines and, and owe back taxes on other properties. But I think, you know, we haven't tested it lately, but I don't think that they're enforcing that, that right? um, yeah. for the most part. I mean, they don't have the really the staff uh, I mean that's their argument to, to investigate every bidder and you know these people form LLC's and um, yeah so. Eric do you, Eric or Allie, either one of you do it would I, I think it would be helpful if one of if somebody would step back and kind of explain these different foreclosure process, processes or purchase processes just for the for the audience like what's mortgage foreclosure or what's the tax foreclosure <coughs> What are we talking about when we talk about a land contract? And then we can, do you want to? Sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm a postdoc at Brown, but I did my PhD in urban planning at the University of Michigan, working with Raghi Dewar. And um, my research began with the mortgage foreclosure crisis in Detroit, and looking at what happened with all the properties that were re repossessed by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or um, these large lenders that have been responsible for issuing subprime loans through the early 2000s. And so between 2005 and 2013, there were uh, roughly 70,000 completed mortgage foreclosures in the city of Detroit alone. Uh, something approaching 99% of those properties were repossessed, not sold at auction to another home buyer. These are properties that were taken into these institutional inventories. These properties are referred to as real estate owned or REO in the bank industry parlance. And what I was looking at were the practices of these different uh, foreclosed property owning institutions for selling or discharging those properties. And I was finding that uh, Fannie Mae in particular was bundling homes and selling them to these private equity backed um, sort of opaque operators, Harbor Portfolio Solutions being one that's gotten a lot of attention, one of the um, largest contract for deed operators, both in Detroit but in other um, industrial Midwestern cities and parts of the Southeast. Um, so the mortgage foreclosure process was an important pipeline for later speculative property investment. A few years past that, I would say starting more in 2009, we saw the, the sharp spike in tax foreclosures in the city, right? And so these are properties that are being repossessed because of delinquent property taxes. There was uh, Public Act 123 that was instituted in 1999. So from 2002 on, properties could be repossessed and auctioned after three years of delinquency. And um, that became another important pipeline. So we had um, more local or regional operators purchasing out of the tax foreclosure pipeline, people who knew how to game the system, right? Maybe buying properties back after allowing them to go through tax foreclosure. But there were some of these national operators, you know, Harbor Portfolio and others, who were using the REO auction system um, to purchase from. And contract for deed is a um, ruthlessly efficient tool for predatory investors to use to make quick money on these properties. So they're buying homes that have often sat vacant because banks and Fannie Mae aren't maintaining them. These properties wouldn't mortgage out. You wouldn't be able to buy the home with a mortgage because it wouldn't serve as collateral to a financial institution. Um, and through contract for deed, you can put all the costs of bringing the property up to code onto your prospective buyer. And then these buyers, so yeah, people who have been displaced through foreclosure, um, folks with low income, damaged credit, insecure income. And so we have the, you know, this growing supply of these properties in institutional hands and then this growing demand from this precarious class of, um, of, of households in Detroit. So it kind of created a perfect storm for the, the return of a contract for deed. I think you outlined a lot of the essential features of the contract for deed, right? The as is condition is um, particularly problematic, you know, if these homes are, uh, have holes in the roofs, don't lack mechanical, so they're uninhabitable for the people who are there. So if you have, you know, families in these homes, it's it's dangerous, unhealthy for the, the inhabitants. But it's really difficult to actually bring those properties up to code in four months, and there's a clawback where the uh, contract seller can repossess the property in four months if they're not brought back up to code. 
So whatever money you put into the property in the time, of, you know, out of your own pocket on top of the down payment is gone because you don't build equity in the process of paying your installment payments to the, the contract buyer. Um, and there are other types of exploitive mechanisms that are sort of in the vein, right, that lease with option plan as well. And then similarly, you have people who are buying and then uh, renting out these properties, but they're not paying property taxes. So these are, you know, what have been called milker type investors by, I think, Alan Malik is the person people often uh, reference when talking about these different classes of investors who operate in distressed housing markets. And so you're renting a property and then you can have it, you know, you can be removed from it. You don't even know that the property is going through tax foreclosure until somebody comes to the door to take control of that property, perhaps offer you a chance to remain as a renter, maybe to an increased price or perhaps to push you out. So that's kind of the, the, the arc of my research is, you know, beginning with, um, you know, a lot of folks have done work on the concentration of predatory subprime lending in communities of color and in inner city areas like Detroit. And then looking, you know, I've been looking further out from the repossession of mortgage foreclosed properties to speculative practices over the past several years. From all of that, I was gonna. Do you have something? I was gonna ask, to ask you a question. Okay. Do you have something you I'll wanted, take your question. You <laughs> no, but I was just thinking because we're talking about. I'm talking about bigger processes, and then we've talked a bit about some of the challenges of the way things play out on the ground. But I, th I think one of the perspectives you can also offer is you've done a lot of work on these actual speculators. Yeah. And the way that they approach it and, and are thinking yeah. about it. So I, I first want to just start by saying it feels kind of funny to be here because I feel like I read a lot of Eric and Josh's work and so basically just going to be synthesizing <laughs> their work that I then put into articles. And Christine is um, a friend but also a mentor and just an amazing journalist. And she's been doing this for a really, really long time. So there's just a lot of knowledge already here. <laughs> Um, so in terms of, in terms of specula speculation, um, a piece that I published over the summer um, was focusing on, um, when I started at the Detroit Free Press, I was on the breaking news desk, and so there's a lot of kind of silly news that comes to you and you have to kind of write it up. And one of the stories that was sent to me was about a um, house on the east side that was selling for $4,000. It was on Zillow. And in the Zillow ad, it, it was kind of worded strangely, and it said there might be a friendly squatter inside. Mm -hmm. And the, <laughs> the people, who, the editors who sent it to me, they kind of thought it was funny. And they kind of thought that like, oh, this will, this will be viral. Like, that's amusing. But to me, I was like, that's really weird. Like, how? How, do, how is someone selling a property and not, not aware if another person is living in their property or not? It, it was so kind of ambiguous. Um, so I wanted to find out who actually owned the property and I went to the Wayne County Register of Deeds and it was this LLC uh, based in Los Angeles. And I was able to track down, and, and I was able to see that they purchased it at the they didn't purchase it at the tax auction, but I saw that the house had been foreclosed upon in, I believe, either 2012 or 2013. So you're able to see that this house was foreclosed and then now flash forward like four years later and they're trying to offload it for this really minimal price, $4,000, and that there might be, and it's, it was technically empty, but there was a squatter inside or a person was actually taking care of it. Um, and so from there, I was able to track down um, the owner of Elite Value Properties. Uh, I was able to get him on the phone, and it was this kind of funny thing where he purchased, he went to a Get Rich Quick class in Indiana where he was encouraged to purchase property. Um, he purchased two properties in Indiana and then came back to LA. And um, a friend said, you should look into Detroit. It's really hot right now. So he bought, um, 23 properties in Detroit um, for just over $14,000 total, um, but all sight unseen. And pretty quickly he realized, he was initially gonna rent them out, so this is kind of going into what Eric was talking about, that kind of speculative practice where it can go two routes. You either rent it out, and the conditions of those properties can be really subpar, um, but you will find people who are really desperate for a 
affordable, even though a lot of times the rates are not actually that affordable, but an option for housing. Um, or people just sit on them because they can't actually find renters. And they're, they're out of state in some cases, so it's even harder if they don't have a management company helping to find someone who is going to rent out the property. Um, but his story, so he started, he realized that it was like way over his head, so he started offloading like the worst of the worst of them, selling them really quickly. And he was selling them to like a couple in Illinois, bought maybe like 10 of them. Um, it, it was just kind of all over the place and, and no, no one was based in Detroit. Um, but he kept three of them. At the time, I was going to do a story on just this, who is wow. this squatter and who is the person living there and what's the story here. Um, but when I kept going back to this house repeatedly, um, the person who was taking care of the house, essentially, he wouldn't talk to me. I left notes and it just, he, I couldn't get him to talk. Um, so I was like, well, I have this list of 23 other properties that this guy owned. Maybe there's a story at one of the other houses. And then as I started, as I started driving to each of these properties, um, I would look them up on Google Images beforehand, see what it would look like once I got there. And by and large, I started to notice that they were all empty. Um, they were blighted. Um, one of them had been demolished, which cost the city um, or the Detroit Land Bank um, $20,000 to demolish, so way over the price that it the initial uh, owed taxes that led to the foreclosure. Um, and so ultimately I looked at the 23 properties and of looking at Google Images, it appeared 78% were occupied um, in 2011 and 12. So right before, uh, 20 of them were foreclosed in 20, 2012, three in 2013. Um, and then when I went to them, 78% were in some distressed state where there was not someone actually living inside of them. Um, so I think that that kind of points to a lot of the work that everyone on here has talked about and has been focusing on as well, which is that um, the people actually, a lot of people buying properties once they go to tax foreclosure are not necessarily um, future homeowners uh, who are going to take care and live in these spaces. And a big part of Public Act 123 that started the auction was about this idea of reactivating abandoned space and also recouping funds. And the other part of that was 60% of those properties that I looked at, um, the speculator, they weren't paying property taxes either. Um, and I think in your, either in an interview or in your paper, I don't <laughs> remember which one, but um, Josh explained it and possibly Eric did some paper, but it was explained really well where it's kind of this musical chairs um, where, because properties are foreclosed after three years of unpaid taxes. And so for a speculator, if you're buying it at auction, it could be a really cheap price. You don't pay taxes. And then, you know, two years from now, if you can't find a renter, just sell it to someone else and hope that you can ideally profit in some sort of way by, by selling it, by bundling a bunch of the distressed properties together. Um, so I, I think that that would be my response. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, and that does fit in with something that surprised yeah. us that we found out on the ground is that, you know, 45, 50 years ago, you got evicted immediately if you didn't pay. And we kept being surprised that people were defaulting on the terms of whatever the agreement were, and they were still there. Yeah. Two months, three months, six months, a year. Mm -hmm. And gradually we came to understand that because these speculators or whatever the name of the company might be um, didn't believe that there was a market for someone else and were afraid to evict the people because A, it would cost them and then B, it might end up with even more destruction. I mean, that they were essentially using, they, these weren't so much squatters as caretakers, right. but they were continuing to live there and make the improvements and then it, it turned out that that gave us some leverage because we could sometimes negotiate to keep them there if they were willing just to start payments again um, of any kind because the, the owners were, none of them were located here. They were all running internet and phone operations, whether it was Harbor or Vision or I could name, you know, a half dozen other companies. Um, let, me, let me just add one other point and it's just, you know, I just happened 
We fought in this city, if we talk about the Detroit context, we fought Coleman Young forever trying to get a homestead program here, a dollar a year program. We won it in Philly and a number of other cities, and they just, you know, it took us forever to win this, and by the time we won it, it was almost ineffective. I happen to be in Madison, Wisconsin. The Acorn Archives are kept at the Wisconsin Historical Society, and um, I was there for another reason. I went by because they just put files and boxes together for another 35 boxes. And so I just happened by you know chance to pick a box that had some part of the Michigan Acorn story. And I read a 2005 document, which was uh, between Acorn and the city of Detroit. And at that point, they said there were 30,000 houses in, in the Detroit inventory. Now there are, what, 80,000, 90,000, nobody's really totally sure. I mean, you may know, but I don't know anymore. Um, I've Big heard some. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just say it's way more than 30. Yeah. Um, so that was 2005. That's 13 years ago. Um, and all the commentary that went with the thing was they were surprised that all of a sudden the city was willing to collaborate with us. And the program was going to be somehow a rent-to-own program where if you signed an agreement, this was the uh, five pages I read, you could then, after a certain number of years, you made those improvements, they would turn over a deed to you. So it wasn't a land grant tax auction bidding, it was a rent, not necessarily like the rent to own programs that I'm talking about these companies using, but a, the city of Detroit would essentially give you a priority. I don't know what ever happened to that program. Okay. Uh, I think they married. tried it and it went Downhill, it, well, uh, it's, it's like written into Public Act 123. It's part of the suite of bills that went yeah. through with Public Act 123, yeah. But wait, wait, wait. Well, I thought this was the, you know, get it home for a dollar, um, mm -hmm. rehab it. And no, this was even it. a different thing. They okay. were going to put up $30 million from the city of Detroit mm -hmm. in 2005 to finance this program. And then, unfortunately, I'm just looking at this five-page document in this file, and it was, you know. Yesterday, so yesterday <laughs> morning, so I didn't have any chance. So I'm just throwing this box. Anybody who knows anything, yeah. let me know or share it with you all. And here I am with all these wizards. I thought, well, Forget somebody me. will know from Detroit. <laughs> you know, I just happened to, you know, pretending to be a historian for half a second here. But, you know. Christine, I mean, you want to make, I had a question for you that I was yeah. thinking about when we were talking about these things. So, Wade included and excluded at the same time in this comment. But a lot of us have jumped on trying to understand and, and research the recent changes, right? Thinking about land contracts in the last, in the last couple of years. But, but I know for me, when I was a grant student doing work in Detroit, you know, your, your big 2011 piece on speculation, mm -hmm. I mean, if, you got, I, if you could get paid by citation, I think I would have made you, <laughs> made you some money <laughs> at this point. Um, but it was incredible, right, yeah. an incredible piece of work. Okay, and I, yes. the reason that I bring it up is I'm curious what you see as perhaps the change from that point in yeah. time to now. Well, uh, yeah, it was, it's, hard, it's um, I was just thinking of that when folks are talking. I mean, it's interesting that we, Detroit was a different situation. Uh, this happened in every big city, but we also had, you know, Kwame Kilpatrick, you know, in um, pr right around the recession, right? So the, at least the coverage we were as reporters, um, you know, we were all writing more mortgage foreclosure, obviously, but the tax foreclosure I think escaped for a long time there, mm. and that because you have to, you know, be three years. Um, uh, delinquent before you're foreclosed, if you think about it, oh wait, you know, you're really not going to see these folks uh, for three years after that. So we were all focused uh, breathlessly, you know, on Kilpatrick, and meanwhile this, you know, ticking time bomb was, was, was happening, right? And thousands of people were in this uh, um, cycle, and it wasn't of interest to anybody, really, to be honest, you know, um, and, you know, the same time the papers were going through, you know, journalism. Is going they were going through their own meltdown, yeah. yeah. Right, so I remember what interested me is just to get out of Kilpatrick coverage. Like, I just didn't want to <laughs> cover it, you know, like the daily grind. And I'm looking at Bill McGraw over there from the free press because he probably understands. But it's like, so I was trying to come up with other, you know, things to look at as a reporter. And then, you know, you just start to 
to realize, well, what, what is happening here? You know, and, and, you know, these thousands of properties, and I ended up focusing on one guy, you know, for that piece um, that's still relevant today, it sounds like, that he, uh, you know, had this whole, um, he would just, he's a local, like Eric talked about, the pipeline, the, the local pipeline, and would, um, buy tons of these properties and do this this similar thing you know land contracts uh, um, would just uh, uh, come in and and uh, dry in and then it would be a total um, non-livable home and uh, would wouldn't do anything or would also you know wouldn't tell you you had to pay that year's taxes that you were buying the home you didn't know you didn't read the whole you know so um, and then you you know the tax bill was so crazy because Detroit's assessments were crazy. So then, you know, and you were too, too in. So I guess, yeah, to the point, we really didn't have changes in the tax auction much at all um, until like, um, you know, the biggest change, I think, unless correct me if I'm wrong, was that change from, you were paying 18% interest on a payment plan, like if you were in debt, and it switched to a 6% and that they went dug in and, um, I think it was dug in, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and, um, uh, you know, Eric Spree and, and Shemansky, the Witovich, I think, was the treasurer at that point, but they went to Lansing and got that done, and that was the most significant. They had small changes aimed at speculators, like we, I had written a lot about, you know, in that time period from 11 to 14 about people who were buying back homes, and they tried to present, stop that, you know, but it wasn't, you know, some of these little changes, like you had to um, pay that first year's taxes when you bought the property, so they were trying to get people to to you know, have the skin in the game and not just buy and then just buy for 500 yeah. and then walk away, right? So we didn't really have a lot of change. And is that because the coverage wasn't there? I wonder, you know, mm -hmm. and the, there wasn't, um, I don't know, as you look back, I, 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 it'd be interesting to look at counting those tax, you know, in uh, both papers, the stories during that period of time, you know, until it wasn't really until I think 15 was the, the, the percentage change, and then they did some other things with payment plans. But uh, so really, there wasn't the system has just stayed pretty stagnant um, of the way it works for mm -hmm. a long time here. Even though we've know that we've we're the biggest in the nation and that we had the most properties, and we know that you know the city was not properly taxing people, right? They were really overassessing uh, for a long time. People did you know people poor people could have got out of these taxes. Uh, through a tax exemption and didn't know about it, you know, we know that. And, uh, you know, we really didn't, uh, the ACLU um, in more recent years, I think it was 16, I want to say, or 15, did sue, but really for those those many, many years, you know, uh, four or five, you know, nothing, nobody challenged this, you know, mm -hmm. um, and that's what people, most of the folks were losing. Um, their home. So I guess if that gets at, you know, I've seen some changes now, you know, with the, with the ACLU's trying in these foundations. There was no foundation interest mm -hmm. during the bulk of this crisis, you know, until uh, later. Um, even in the assessments, you know, no one made, no one really until the ACLU made the argument, here are these people, you, you're, you're over assessing. The city admitted that its assessments were wrong and uh, for the most part and um, that you know, fueled these tax foreclosures, but nobody really challenged that legally either until ACLU, um, and they lost on that aspect. But um, so it, it, it is interesting to see there was very little challenge. Nobody challenged in the city the banks. We've written, you know, Eric and I collaborated on that too. But you know, when the subprime lending and um, in Detroit and the in the condition, like what, yeah, the homes that those banks left, um, and we looked at. Um, using Dan Gilbert's data when he surveyed, you know, that first survey of the whole city and showing uh, that uh, vast majority, you know, f I think it was 50 or 60 percent of those homes that went through mortgage foreclosure that we looked at the data were not in, you know, were dilapidated and were abandoned after the banks. So no, in, in other cities, I, I'm, I can't remember, but I know that there are other cities that challenged those banks and sued those banks of so the condition of the homes and we didn't. Yeah, sure, Miami. I mean, yeah. there are 20 or 30 cities. So Miami very, very little one. has been done in Detroit to... And I, you know, I'm glad you brought up the subprime, because I was going to ask if there were many stories about the subprime thing, because all that led up to... Yeah, you know, I mean, Eric Five I, years before 2008, we were negotiating with all these subprime companies, yeah. and Detroit was part of that package. Yeah, we did not cover... I mean, um, that wasn't... 
during the 08 or prior, you know, it, we didn't cover a lot of that. Um, even um, I think the paper just ignored it again. But really, it was later when Eric and I did the analysis that we did find, I think I looked at it, it was like 78% of the subprime um, loans. 78% of those homes were now dilapidated or needed to be demoed or had already been demoed. So, um, you know, it was, a, it was our story, it was kind of like a, I don't know what you would call it, um, after the fact, you know, right. analysis, mm -hmm. which, you know, sucks because there's nothing really <laughs> you can do at that point. But, I mean, it, uh, but yeah, it, it definitely devastated those, those homes clearly, you know, were, were um, uh, went downhill after. Sure. But I don't know. Because when we used to negotiate around them making changes in these uh, predatory agreements, I mean, we used to use the figure that to maintain a vacant house, you know, for a bank and mm -hmm. for any of the subprime companies, whether it was home finance, which was bought by HSBC or, you know, the city mortgage, uh, whatever. You know, the, use, the average cost to maintain was about 50000 a year for a while because you had to pay to pay the taxes, you had to pay the insurance, and you had to do the loan. And what, what was so different, particularly after 2008, is they just stopped paying any of the maintenance at all. Yeah. So not only did they, in some cases, not foreclose because they were running shadow banks, I mean, they were ghost banks, I think was the proper term, because they had no interest in writing down the mortgages to real value in the market, which would have allowed people to stay in the homes or purchase the homes. It was in their interest to let these homes then pretend to be worth X amount, go vacant, because it was on their balance sheet that they were at that price they'd made the loan. And then they stopped doing maintenance. And then the banks, I'm sort of riled up about this issue. <laughs> but I'm riled up about a lot of issues, but you know, I'm just trying to be, you know, behave in the panel. But uh, <laughs> so, for some reason, the Obama administration then said, okay, who's going to supervise all this? You all know the answer? Banks. So the banks who had no interest to do anything whatsoever. And, you know, in 2010, we put together a program in Phoenix and a couple of other cities that were very high on these foreclosures to try to renegotiate. And it was, you know, a disaster because you were doing actions on the banks. The banks had no interest in moving, and they didn't. And so, here we go. <laughs> and now they're so profitable. I mean, look, right. look who was smart. Just one other point. I mean, even the basics of when those houses were demoed, the city, for the most part, never went after the, those costs. It never, you know. Tried to recover. Right. Mm -hmm. So the government, you're paying that. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, now there is a small program to go after some, uh, that tax debt that was walked away. So even though somebody's, you know, Mike Kelly or whoever, you know, walked away from a house and it got sold at auction, they are trying to go after Mike Kelly, for one, and some of these other people, and to try to get those back taxes, because there's a personal responsibility, I guess, in the law that, that, that they have an argument there that they can go after folks even once that property is sold. But the, yeah, it's, it's... I mean, there uh, are some cities that have ordinances that say, you know, if the city cuts your lot, they can bill you for that and attach any sale you try to do. Yeah. Same for if they have to demo the property that they yeah. can, you know, attach any, any attempt yeah, to... Yeah, Duggan has more, been more aggressive. He's hired a firm in the last two years or so that's, that's gone after the debt blight tickets um, and some of the property tax. Okay. But I'm not aware of maybe uh, that the demo, maybe that's on their list too, but those demo costs, that's a lot, you know, that they've let go. Uh, so if we're going back to the subprime, yeah. I mean, something that, you know, thinking about... Those were the good times. Well, in, insecurity, but back to <laughs> when neighborhoods, you know, provided some amount of security. So the subprime crisis was in cities like Detroit, um, often caused by predatory refinance loans. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Detroit was a city of homeowners, yeah. right? That's what it was known at for a very long time, and particularly for African Americans. But most so, studies say that refi across the country was the driving problem on the subprime now. Yes, but what I'm saying is you had people who owned their homes. Right. Yeah. These they may not have had a lot of cash, but they owned their home, and so they were, you know, for all intents and purposes, living that American dream until federal deregulation and the entrance of these predatory private lenders came in yeah. to undermine that. Right. And so I think, you know, I, that's a point I try to push. Maybe not for folks here who know this. The, the predatory lenders were 
Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Citigroup. I mean, we're not talking about gotcha. yeah. Joe Blow with a little sign in some neighborhood. We're talking about the major money center banks that are still the major money center banks that right. were. Who used um, sophisticated data analysis to target these neighborhoods with those particular toxic products. Yeah, and, and not only those banks, but Goldman Sachs. I mean, in 2005, six, and seven, there's hardly a hedge fund in New York that we didn't end up, and I was in those negotiations as well as the one. Well, I mean, you know, some of the worst days of my life were in Orange County where you deal with four of them in a row. You know, you'd get in there that morning and try to fly out of John Wayne that night, and you would have met with four different predatory companies were almost all owned by New York or financed by, you know, and they just all got away with it. And you wonder, okay, so now we're doing mop-up um, stories that we can't keep up with. I mean, I don't care if it's ProPublica or any, or any local, you know, group trying to do it. I mean, it's all after the fact and it doesn't drive policy because we don't have boots on the ground that are trying to push this issue at this point. I mean, turning on that boots on on the ground component. I, I mean, I think it would be interesting. So, talking about banks and the finance and these different forces and the way they've um, are operating. But I guess what? Um, how do these things affect both like neighborhood stability? So, thinking about like what Eric was talking about at one point, right? You have homeowners; they may not have a lot of money, but it's a stable neighborhood. And and what kind of challenges is it? Present, prevent, or present for, for families in Detroit? What, what, are they, what are they facing in that way? Um, <clears throat> I, so I recently did a piece about this new, newish program um, that is a partnership between the city and United Community Housing Coalition to purchase um, 500 occupied homes. So using the right of first refusal to purchase occupied foreclosed homes that were slated for auction and kind of divert them so that the occupants could buy the homes. And it's obviously a really happy, um, positive initiative. It's hard to find critics of it, but um, something that came up a lot as I was working on it was the fact that um, it's estimated 50,000 occupied homes went to auction over the past, and it's probably more than that, over the past two decades. And so uh, as I was reporting it, and it didn't end up being in the piece, I met with a, f a family who did lose their home in 2014. And they, they were renters and their landlord hadn't been paying taxes and so they ended up um, getting kicked out of their home. And they, they moved around a lot. And one of the things that stood out to me when I was interviewing uh, the 20 year old daughter who dropped out of school she couldn't even remember what year she had dropped out, but she had bounced around just from so many schools. And that to me was such, I don't, it doesn't, it, it's something that we realize, but it doesn't come up. Obviously Detroit has school choice and we talk a lot about um, how that affects kind of stability for students when you're bouncing from school to school, um, but kind of to understand how actually housing, which seems like an obvious, but how has, how how housing, um, plays into kind of the education system as well and how that's going to um, exacerbate the instability caused in, in the school system. That to me was super, I think, something I would like to look into more in the future because that um, it, felt really, it felt really devastating because, um, yeah, just, oh, there, she, yeah. I, I, yeah, I don't, it's, it's really hard to catch up and stay ahead when you are constantly going from school to school. But yeah. that's one anecdote. Right. It's difficult, yeah, how would you, I've thought about how do you look at that, you know, do you look at those areas, uh, you know, I, what is they call it in uh, education, that's the, the, there is a term for it, the, I know Chalkbeat just did a piece. They did a great piece. Yeah, on it, uh, the turnover, uh, there is a word for it, when um, the rate of, in a school where kids are leaving, but, um, you know, compare that to the tax or closures in those areas. No, but yeah, yeah, it's a, you know, in every anecdotal, just about story you, you see that the kids are um, affected and they have to go to a different school or, you know, um, it's very, very, uh, you know, these, these issues tie together. And as reporters, you know, it's on us to, to tie those, but a lot of times you don't, unfortunately, that you're, you know, your beat is this and you're, you know, 
doing, you're going to highlight this program, this this problem. But yeah. it'd be, it's important to look at that broader um, connection. But yeah. yeah, I know we're talking about housing, but when it goes, when it morphs into those kind of issues, the churning, particularly in in almost all the states where it's testing is part of the evaluative system now. If you are a principal in a school and can get rid of that per that child who's not doing well before the end of the semester, you still get the money, yeah. but don't have to count them on the testing. So there's a, an internal pressure within the school system now to push people out in the same way you have housing and other circumstances. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's just not easy not having money these days. I don't know if this has, you know, come to you, but I mean, there's this unequal thing going on between the rich and all the rest of us, and uh, there's hardly any issue we could talk about where you can't just sort of get fired up. I mean, it's uh, um, just a comment, just a sign. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a comment. Shock. Yeah. Shock. Yeah. I don't, but there is I don't a work for a newspaper, so yeah. I have to pretend to be objective, or a university. It's just like, ah, <laughs> you know. I hear from our members every day. It's just one, you know, horror story after another. I know this isn't about journalism necessarily, but just to, to you know, it's hard to write these stories every year. And, and from, like, I, you yes. know, I would write from, a, you know, that 2011 on and on. And I would, my editors were, you, are you done with this yet? You know, what, you know, that actually, doesn't that sound system? like this story? You'd pitch a story, don't you? Doesn't that sound like what you did two years ago? Or, you know what I'm saying? It's like, and we were in the midst of it, like 15, and I would get this from editors. And so it was very, it's, you just start to doubt yourself. You know, I guess I should be writing about something else. And, and there is a fatigue, Detroit fatigue in the greater community, like the readers, uh, you know, Port Detroit again, do we, you know, I need to read this story, so you try to find new ways. So I would focus in my coverage a lot about uh, the, the quote unquote bad guy, you know, uh, the, the person doing this and how the system worked to try to, to, to make it a little different, not, not so much uh, the poor, you know, the poor family again, uh, f but, you know, to get folks interested, like how, you know, I did a story about, we talked about people not paying taxes, but that were, landlords that were collecting Section 8 money for the government. So the government's giving you money to house a poor person and then they're not paying taxes and they would buy their own homes back at the auction because nobody else wanted it. So you'd literally have people who never paid, you know, paid taxes, these landlords, and they would get, um, you know, 600, 700 a month, even more. So a lot of steady stream of income, but it's a way for them to, you know, to, to save that money. So you try to tell the story uh, you know, find those other ways to, to, to tell the story. But I think, yeah, that it, um, that's what I struggle with because people yeah. are immune, a lot of people are immune and, you know, and um, is that why we haven't gotten a lot of change in terms of uh, reform? You know, they're, they're talking about potentially now going on a, a retroactive poverty tax mm -hmm. exemption, which can, would, could be significant. So if, if you mm -hmm. apply, um, but you only have that year to apply, but a lot of people uh, are in foreclosure, and they could have could have got out of those previous year's taxes. So they're thinking um, there's a guy uh, that's going to pursue it in Lansing back three years. But we'll see if um, you know that that Lansing may not want to do that because that could open up the rest of the state, you know, or potentially. But they want to just isolate it for Detroit. So, but yeah, there there has not been a lot of um, reforms that have gotten through or changed to this. Yeah. Well, I, I think I, uh, I was going to say you read my notes, but I remember oh. I sent you my notes because yeah. this is the question I was going <laughs> to, that was the question I was going to have. I say, well, ask just kind of one more for, and it's for all of you, and then we'll, we'll open it up uh, for Q&A because I think people will have questions. But um, we've talked about kind of, you know, a lot there, just as there's some change, there hasn't been a lot of change in kind of stemming the tide of these things. Um, you've mentioned you know, poverty tax exemption, some changes there, some potentials. There's payment plans and things. Um, there's lawsuits against speculators, right? There's a lot of things in the work, but I'm curious from your reporting experience and organizing on the ground and, and from the research you're doing, Eric, what of these you know, holds potential to kind of slow the tide or, or turn the tide in some ways for these families? <laughs> I mean, the, the legal regime that protects tenants 
is still tragically weak. And, you know, part of that is based on, I mean, we can talk about all the, uh, you know, sort of bottom fishers in the real estate industry, but as long as, you know, campaign contributions, real estate companies are always, I mean, I don't know all the details of everything in terms of, of Detroit and Michigan about that, but in markets throughout the country, you always find real estate interest in developers among the highest group of people and contractors in terms of campaign contributions. So all of those things mitigate against things like rent controls, mm -hmm. anti-gentrification measures, and real protections. I mean, at one point we thought, okay, here's what will really solve this problem around home savers is requiring a certificate, you know, what used to be called a warrant of habitability before you could do a transaction before the company ever got it. And we saw something in Toledo, Ohio. Well, that looked like a model. Maybe that would work. And then we found out that they even had a better one written in Detroit, but no inspectors. Nobody, nobody you know, so nobody was going to be... On lead, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, no lead, inspectors yeah. on lead and, and nobody yeah. who who inspected the property before it went over to someone in these contracts. So, well, okay, that Toledo thing won't work. <laughs> you know, so, but you have to have a, a, a regulatory regime and that actually puts people first, whether it's as renters or potential homeowners or people signing these contracts. And uh, the number of people here in, in Detroit, I mean, we once on one day found three different families under Detroit Property Exchange who had, I don't know if I wasn't supposed to say the company, but I mean, what a bunch of bums those are. Those are local bums. That's not like Vision. Those are South Carolina, Harbors, Dallas. You can say a lot about the South. I live in New Orleans, but you got them. You got them right here, River City. Um, so in each of those cases, they had not done a contract for deed, these homeowners. They were paying, they were on time in their mortgage payments through a mortgage broker. Aside, mortgage brokers are among the worst criminals that drove the 2008 meltdown and have walked away without a uh, never in new mind. Uh, no licensing requirements still on a national level. Nobody went to jail, whatever. Um, that was an aside, back, <laughs> back, you know, trying to walk the line here. And all of a sudden, they got a notice from that. Detroit Property Exchange called them and said, we now own your house. And they said, what are you talking about? I'm paying the mortgage. They didn't know their mortgage broker was not paying their taxes. They didn't know in some cases, in one case, that their mortgage broker had declared bankruptcy and was just still collecting their payments. So they then found that if they wanted to stay in that house, now I know from the reporters that they were probably being classified as squatters temporarily, if they wanted to stay in that house, they could sign a new contract and start all over with DPX. And you said to them, well, you know, what keeps you from grabbing a gun and putting on a ski mask, which is you know, not exactly what I say, but it's pretty close to what I say. And, and you know, well, you know, they did do some things, so they would, you know, if I gave them all my tax refund, they would count that as double against the money. Well, not, this is, these are women that are paying for their house a second time. And, you know, basically, well, you know, I now, you know, in five or six years, they paid for it the second time with all these sort of double and triple deals because all DPX had paid to get the house was just the back taxes. So they paid a couple of grand back taxes. So they could make these sort of, you know, okay, two for one deal on your taxes. I'll give you credit for $3,000. You give me 1500 and so you were able to get back the money. And meanwhile, they made, you know, two or $300,000, two or 200% or profit or whatever. Yeah. Not bad. Never had to do a thing, no repairs, no, no paperwork. Thanks to, you know, and no notice to that potential owner who had paperwork on it from anybody at the tax office or city of Detroit that that was in arrears. But DPX knew. Seems like there might be something to that if I were looking into it, but I'm just organizing. So. Uh, you know, the one point you, the city is now, um, no, uh, well, no, um, it's, it's trying to inspect all rentals, at least. Uh, they're going to the zip code by zip code. You know, we did a piece that they, you know, looked at evictions with Eric and, the, the city responded and acknowledged that it was just it was just um, on demand. If you were uh, for many many years, 
if you were a renter and you were in a substandard and you called and complained, they would generally not always send somebody out. But um, so now everybody, they're trying to, to, to uh, get everybody registered, but that is causing, you know, issues as well. I mean, some people think that that's going to force these, or the landlords will end up okay. ditching them quicker yeah. because they don't want to go through or more will do land contracts because mm -hmm. potentially they don't have to get the city to, you know, sign off and that you're in a decent um, house. So it is... Uh, so after you're inspected, are you required to repair? Yes. Yeah, you should require to abate the lead. You know, you're required to do these things, but a lot of them, you know, and is will there a further inspection slow. to see yeah. if that happens. Yeah, uh, allegedly, you know, they've hired a lot of third-party companies to do this these oh. this work. Yeah. Yep. So oh. we're wow. They've only gotten to and to see this one going down. Yeah. Right. The first okay. couple. Um, so much zip for codes. optimism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know. It's still in a. I, but part of that but this is, is the good news. This is the yeah, good news. Yeah, this is the good They're news. Expected. And part of it is that the, the people can now, uh, you, you could escrow your rent before, but this is more formal now in the uh, city ordinance that you're able to, to not be evicted uh, if they don't have a certificate of compliance and that you can escrow actually with the city. So there's, you know, um, a couple dozen. The last time I checked, it probably is more than that, but that, you know, that are escrowing their rent. I heard uh, it was about 50. At 50, okay. Yep. So we'll see. You know, they've only gotten to these first couple of zip codes in this first year, but um, you know that is potentially has a, could have a huge impact. But there could be a negative. You know, so it's it's hard. It's a tough, tough one. Um, so, Eric, there are fifty that are in escrow. Uh, this is what I heard from. So that could be a, a huge organizing problem. We could probably yeah. fairly quickly get thousands in escrow and really create a crisis here. So <laughs> I'm going to have to leave. Right. <laughs> it looks you like are. I've got a you know, job to do. Um, right. But anybody wants to help, see me after, yeah. you know, after the meeting. But yeah, OK, I didn't realize that, because yeah. that's a handle. Yeah. Yeah, landlords are squealing about it. I mean, they're upset. Yeah, you know, it'll be changed can, soon. That's yeah. why I have to move right. fast. I know, it's right. going to be They're going <laughs> to gut this thing like a fish. Uh, so I'll be well, rolling Well, you know, here, because you're Toledo, the thing that you mentioned, Toledo, lead, we have the most aggressive lead laws on the books, but we haven't been enforcing them, right, the lead paint. And then so part of why the landlords are upset is because they have to pay for these lead inspections, and those are pretty costly. And then you have to do them every year. So the city did change try to soften the, the, the laws a little bit in terms of like inspections that you don't, you don't if, you're, if you're all good, you pay your taxes and you're, you're clear, you don't have to get another ins regular inspection for three years. But the lead you have to do every year. So that's their biggest issue that, you know, but we know our kids in some of the, you know, are, have the highest, higher than Flint um, yeah. poison levels. So, you know, um, and, uh, you know, the, the city hasn't even been focusing in the, there are a couple of zip codes where it's in the 20s, I think, percentages, hmm. and those are they're extremely high. And those, those aren't even the areas that they're focused on for the inspections. They haven't gotten to those zip codes yet, so, which is an interesting policy, but you think and you what, what the heck, leg, de leg damage is only permanent, you know, so. Yeah. How about you, Allie? Do you see anything? That um, yeah, I think from a homeowner perspective, I'm really, I think paying attention to kind of uh, the poverty tax exemption changes. Um, it's going back to, again, the UCHC city partnership, I think um, relying, having to rely too heavily, because that was largely subsidized by um, funding from Quicken Loans Community Fund, having to rely too much on foundations to kind of solve some of these problems doesn't actually seem like and solve the problems at the very end doesn't actually seem like a very long-term smart solution. So it would really come from kind of smart public policy. Um, I think some of the lawsuits and litigation that's been happening, putting pressure for kind of larger changes. So I think what Christine mentioned about paying attention to Lansing with if the poverty tax exemptions will become retro retroactive. Um, and then, yeah, just accessibility. It just seems like so many people don't realize in terms of homeowners uh, realize that they have this opportunity that they can apply for poverty tax exemption, um, which would really, if this was happening earlier and it was easier, um, it could mitigate a lot of the problems that we're seeing down the line. So, so that is a, something positive to look <laughs> at and pay attention to. Um, I don't you know, no longer have my finger quite on the pulse of what's happening in Detroit in the way that you all um, do. I mean, having been um, 
out of state for the last year, but um, I have been working with some attorneys who've been very interested in using the Detroit eviction story to make a case for guaranteed uh, legal protections for people facing oh, eviction. Okay. And there have been, um, there, there's precedent for this. New York City, I think, was the yeah. first to pass legislation guaranteeing. But they had to make the case on a financial basis, saying that it actually costs the city less money because of uh, public services that would have been provided in the instance of foreclosure. So it's unfortunate that that has to be the, um, you know, criterion to meet in order to, you know, perhaps guarantee the passage of that legislation. I think Philadelphia um, is close to, or maybe, passed in provisional consideration of a similar one. So, um, you know, something like, so obviously, if we can have some changes to get people out of these predatory contract for deeds, the people who are actually still in those properties that haven't already gone back through tax foreclosure, you know, it's, uh, you know, that, that situation's kind of come to a close for, I think, so many people. Yeah. But if we can transition them out into mortgages or some way that they can build equity, the kind of mm -hmm. work that you've been doing, Wade, but then also for all the tenants, if we can find some way to keep them from being pushed out of their properties, mm -hmm. Um, when these courts are just processing these evictions, mm. you know, fast and furious, always side with the landlord yeah. with these, these, these information asymmetries. So that would be a, a positive yeah. step. Excellent. Thank you. Um, you know, looking around the room, we, uh, so we have a number of people with uh, expertise up here, but uh, we, we might match it or exceed it uh, in the room as well. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and open it up uh, for Q&A. Yeah, so, um, given that um, you know, the issue of, of you know, speculation and predatory lending practices is, you know, it's a, it's a matter of, of you, you have these, um, you know, persons or, or companies or firms that, that go in and they, um, you know, they they purchase land and whatever buildings are on top of it, and um, without doing anything productive, they're able to then you know extract wealth from a community and from individuals um, without really providing anything in return. Um, you know, I wonder if, if you know, the, the, there's been a lot of discussion of these, um, you know, regulatory changes around the margins, but um, given that the, there is this structural issue that's connected to the very way that we conceive of land ownership and taxation in the first place, um, and that, you know, part of the reason why there's so much precariousness um, and why housing is unaffordable in the first place is because of uh, insufficient, you know, housing supply. Do um, you know if anybody, any person or organization in Detroit or the Detroit area is pushing for land value tax, um, you know, to um, recapture the economic rent associated with loca land locations um, to, you know, encourage the development of more housing supply and to take away the economic bargaining power, um, you know, from these speculators and landlords and banks um, and return it to, you know, the, the people. Um, you know, is, is there any, like, serious consideration of land value tax in Detroit? Um, Mark Skidmore he, at MSU, he, had, uh, he um, did a lot of work on this. If you want to Google him, um, um, he's written, I, I know he had a proposal along those lines, um, but I don't think, and I think Ken Cockrell at one point, mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but, uh, um, paid for him, I want to say, I'm blanking, but paid for him to do a study along those lines. But I, no, I'm not aware of anybody currently, you know, pushing it. So, um, but if you, you know, check his work out and um, I can give you my card after, but I'm pretty sure, I think Ken even, you know, when he, uh, before he became mayor um, for that short period of time actually funded a study on that. But. Greg? This, this gets very kind of discouraging and depressing, and it shouldn't be that way. And so I'm going to kind of push back on something that Christine said. Um, it's going to take me a minute or two to formulate this. As, as you've talked about, and as I think most of us in the room here know, there, there are two big engines behind this monstrous foreclosure crisis. Foreclosure event that's rolled out um, in Detroit. Uh, the first was with the mortgage foreclosures, and then more recently it's now with uh, tax foreclosures. The engine behind the tax foreclosures, as was pointed out, was is basically two things. One, that the city 
did not reassess property values following the collapse of the real estate industry in 2007, 8, 9. And so the city was consistently and systematically assessing properties at values you know, 10 times what their true market value was and, and refused to change that. In no, in no small part because they weren't able to, partly because they didn't have the money to reassess it or the assessors to do it, and partly because they knew that if they actually did set those property values at the actual market values, that you know that would just that further much. jeopardize the precarious financial situation of the city. So the. The refusal the, uh, you know, to reassess property values was one piece of it. The other piece was this um, hiding out, out of sight the, the fact that by state law, low income homeowners, if they simply applied, simply, if they applied for an exemption, would be totally exempt from paying their property taxes. Those two things together is what led to the fact that we, Marty, what, we, we got roughly 300,000 parcels in the city of Detroit. Yeah, yeah 20, ballpark 300,000. Thank you, Marty. Uh, ballpark 300,000 parcels in the city of Detroit. Ballpark 100,000 of them went into tax foreclosure in the last half dozen years. One out of three. There's a higher. We're sitting practically in the city in a few months in the in the place of the highest concentration of, of this pushing people out of their homes of anywhere in the United States. Um, just, you know, and, and that's, and, that, and, we're, and many of us are <coughs> discouraged about it. But that's changed, okay? We were going from uh, 10,000 or so, you know, many thousands of occupied houses are people, going on the tax auction every year to now this time it's it's measured in the hundreds not in the thousands that but how many people are on payment plans yeah, yeah. how many are just I, know, in the mill know, yeah i know we drag it and we're fighting that and we will still fight that but here's the thing both of those big engines the the failure to reassess property values and the failure to provide the tax exam, property tax exemptions. So we, both of those things are pretty well addressed now. The first one is addressed because Christine read it. I mean, she wrote a series of stories that brought enough attention, including state attention to this, that the city was mandated to do that property assessment. And the assessed values went down um, pretty substantially, not always perfectly, but that's you know, there's a lot of progress that made on that. The other piece is the, is the um, low-income property tax exemption thing that the city was hiding and slow walking and in some cases just flat out, you know, um, refusing to grant the exemptions to people who had done everything they were supposed to do. That's pretty well killed now. And that didn't happen by accident. It happened because a lot of people pushed on it. Good people, good reporters who did good reporting brought that to public attention. Good attorneys investigated this. Good scholars did scholarly research yeah. that actually had some you know, practical value to it. Uh, Marty's done a lot. Mark Skidmore has done a lot. Others have done a lot to, to <coughs> provide uh, Bernadette uh, to a Hene did the research to show that you know, many other people did that. And then organizers in the neighborhoods did this as well. We've been meeting with Mr. Donwell and, and the folks in the assessor's office for years. We have monthly meetings now with the Department of Neighborhoods. Um, Alexa knows this. Um, and so it, you know, there is, it's the, the, is the fight done? Of course it's not done. Have we made some progress? Absolutely, we've made a lot of progress. And I, and I would really hate if that kind of progress got lost here in the shuffle somehow. We are killing this thing. It's not dead yet, but we're working on it. And I think that we should acknowledge that as well as acknowledge the 
immensity of the injustice that's going on here. So I just wanted to get that out. Thank you. Does anybody want to I, th no, I agree. I mean, you, th but this has all been recent, you know, uh, in the last two. No, no, and it all, and it has all been recent. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, but because a lot of people lost. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and there was total inaction for those right. years, even though the problem was written, you know, the plot problem was clear and people knew it. And there's no the government knew it, yeah. you know, and directly if I didn't, you know, if we didn't write about it enough, they knew what was going on. So there wasn't a lot of change. So I don't know. Um, yeah, there's not much I else I could say. Yeah. Um, Jacob and then Alexis. I was just um, wondering what your guys' thoughts were on um, how local governments contributed to this issue through um, through uh, how they chose to spend their capital that they were given by the federal government, like by hardest hit funds, or um, how they chose to get how, how they chose to get subsidies to businesses as opposed to other things that do money. So. Yeah, that was definitely a point of contention uh, for for several of these years that the hardest hit funds were primarily you know spent on demos and rather than uh, I mean some of it was spent. Um, um, uh, some of it was allocated, I believe, to, to I'm, I'm not sure if it was first, um, God, I'm blanking on the, Mark, maybe you can help me, the um, program the folks can apply to, to step step forward. Forward. Step forward, yeah, step forward. yeah, um, got some of that money, but, uh, yeah, I mean, that, sorry, oh, yeah. Explain for a lot of people here may not know what the hardest hit funds are or the program yeah, there were federal funds that um, uh, came to urban areas to, um, they were from, God, I'm, I mean, it was a big, big settlement. Yeah, big, big, sorry. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we, pr Detroit primarily spent it, obviously, to, to, to get these houses down um, that were a danger and they were effect on neighborhoods and, and dramatically. Because so the state required that the money be spent. Be spent that way, yeah. It, well, they could have, I mean, could have lobbied hard to change that, you know. Uh, so, um, yeah, but that was the point, again, that folks brought up, uh, particularly activists that felt like it should have been uh, divided, uh, more, more spent on directly keeping people in their homes, yeah. Well, when was that money allocated? I mean, it was so late after so yeah. many people had already been taken yeah. out of their homes. So then yeah. you have this money being allocated, and what do we do with it? We're going to demolish the homes that we'd already dispossessed people from. But certainly, you know, and not only in Detroit, but in almost every city, the manipulation of community development block grant monies, which are absolutely, you know, by the statute for low to moderate income communities, and how those have been in many cases used to fund, you know, developers' castles in the sky and, you know, people use zip codes and census tracts where they're, you know, claiming that, you know, what they're doing benefits people because they're in that district and has nothing to do. And there's also no, uh, virtually no accountability after the money is spent in terms of whether or not people got the alleged jobs or the benefits. And that's been going on for years. Um, I think an interesting thing for the piece, again, I feel like I just keep going back to this one piece, but the ROR piece, you know, this the city has had the ability to use the right of first refusal since the beginning of public back one, two, three. They haven't. Can you explain right? right. So, so right of first refusal means that um, once a property has been foreclosed, um, the city, um, the county, um, have an opportunity to purchase the property um, for the taxes owed. Um, prior to it going to so being able to divert it from the auction and typically it's been used for um, development and when I spoke with Arthur Jemison from the city about why that has been the case he kind of said something along the lines of well we were looking at um, you know development that could create a tax base and like an economic incentive but I think it's kind of this interesting thing where when people actually got forced out of their homes um, you're you're devaluing the val you're you're create um, you're distressing neighborhoods and actually um, bringing down the value long term. So in a weird way, uh, it the argument of focusing on development 
you could easily argue that keeping people in their homes could have the same um, effect. And so utilizing ROR earlier um, to keep people in their homes is, is just as beneficial as maybe a development project, one Particularly could argue. Particularly if you give the development project a tax break and they don't have to pay taxes for 10, 20 years, or you know, 30 right. years they can divert to another purpose. Or Yeah, I'll say one thing, not contradicting your statements, but thinking about kind of how, you know, this post-crisis thing, how these things either get dispersed in ways that either we can't notice or don't immediately see it in the, the ordinance. Um, with inspections is one example of that, is like even our solution is, you know, causing more problems. And um, I mean, the right of first refusal program, I think, is another good example of how, I mean, these things get reproduced in, in ways that we don't pick up on or um, we're not even equipped to deal with. I, what I mean there is that, um, you know, I mean, it's a city partnership program. The city's always been able to do this. They, they didn't even know that they, it never occurred to Arthur Johnson before Ted brought it up to him. but. Um, you know, they don't, they don't really, they're not really partnering in the program. I mean, they, they, they do the transaction, but then it's the United Community Housing Coalition's job to, to implement the entire program and, and all of the responsibility that gets displaced from the government to organizations and activists to do all of this work is, is a, incredible. And then, you know, and to, to consider sort of the, the legacy of, the tax foreclosure crisis actually on the structures of the, the homes that people are now purchasing is, um, you know, not <coughs> something to be scoffed at. I mean, it's not easy. It's not going to be easy to take a home from the ROR program and turn that into a long-term American dream either. So, and who's doing inspection of those homes? No, I mean, right? Should sh I mean a lot of these homes should, probably shouldn't be occupied, right. frankly. And when and what do you, there that line? You know, um, you know, it's it's a tough one. You know, uh. it's unclear that we need to st keep promoting something called the American Dream of home ownership. I mean, we really need a regime that looks more closely at what are protections for tenants because what's happened in Detroit is a you know lesson for everyone in this country, particularly for low and moderate income families, that you have no protection owning these homes. You know, and if you listen to the litany of whether you're positive or negative, you know, from Greg or from anybody, the rest of us, you know, I'm not gonna say you, because I'm a little negative on this issue too, but um, it's unclear that we don't need to start pushing for a much different kind of affordable rental program for families than, you know, pretending that somebody, I mean, we have no federal government that's gonna invest in rehabbing houses. So we get this all straightened out in terms of the legal and the taxes and the water bills and whatever. There's no, this is not, you know, a war on poverty. There's not all of a sudden gonna be a billion dollars for Detroit to fix up all these houses. And you're still gonna have the basic capitalist model, which is a house that somebody buys for 20 grand that cost you 40 or 50 to rehab to a basic minimal code value that still is only worth 25 grand at the end of it. And that you can't get a bank to make a loan in this system on that basis. So unless you figure out a way to put the money together in some situation, there's almost no, I mean, we're trying to force some of these predatory companies and, you know, now that we've blocked their access to Fannie Mae auctions and some of the other stuff and they haven't figured out all the nuances of the tax auctions here, to do rehab on these houses so that you can then put people who still have some credit into being able to buy them. But there's no, even, even while we try to convince some of these companies to do it, we've got some pilot projects here in Detroit around, along those the lines. I'm trying to hire somebody to run it tomorrow. I'm not pretending that I can get that to scale at this point because these are, there, there's, ten, there's thousands of houses and none of these people have those kind of resources if, at 50,000 a house. Yeah. So, so, so we've got three hands. 
maybe we'll stack the questions and, uh, and close it up. So we'll go here and then to Alice and then to you, okay? Uh, I was wondering what efforts, if any, are being made to provide people who might be targeted by predatory lenders about sort of like a checklist of these are things that you should look for. And even if people are desperate, human beings understand that saving $150 a month right now, but you end up losing 2000 because of predatory practices, like that's not, yeah. that's not a deal. So, I mean, like the locations that these individuals um, frequent, are there like flyers or info sessions or something? Because policy is great, but it's slow. And uh, if more individuals, if, if fewer individuals, you know, rent from these, um, from these criminals, then they wouldn't have, there would be less demand, and then it wouldn't even be in the predatory lenders' practice to continue to do these horrible things. Okay, so that's the first one, Allison. Hi, thank you for, thank you for a really engaging panel. Um, the, my, my, I have two parts to what I'm asking. The first is about the right of refusal. It's exciting to hear that you're, and these get at the roles that each of us play from our various perches. I'm a PhD student uh, working with a community who's organizing against racist displacement um, on Detroit's east side. And so when I'm thinking about the right of refusal, when we heard about the settlement with the city, um, there was a lot of talk amongst activists and organizers who were like, oh, we need to get people signed up. Because what we haven't said in the conversation about that is that the 500 homes that this, there's the so-called partnership with the city and the CHC, people had to opt in to be signed up for them. You couldn't just be eligible and be on the roll. So organizers at that time were trying to go door to door and get people to sign up for the program. Um, the city was not reaching out and they had made a really quick turnaround about this settlement, that it was gonna be just a couple of weeks and then they extended the deadline. So at that time, organizers were talking about how to get the word out. And I'm wondering about when you're thinking about writing this story now versus writing the story to inform people you need, if you are eligible, you saying. need to sign up for this program. You know, when we're talking about um, where, where are we in this process? And the other part of the question, which is the same question, is thinking about um, the, so in my interviews, um, I talked to uh, government officials, including Arthur Jameson, and also developers, and I would ask them, Okay. influenced by the work of several of the people on this panel, I would ask them, a decade after the financial crisis and um, housing crisis, what are we doing now to guard against financial speculation and housing speculation? And the government people basically answered, oh, you should talk to somebody at the land bank. And they would say, that's a great question. Glad you're really thinking academics are great. Um, the developers would say, don't worry about that. We're dealing with a fundamentally different issue. It's not really related to the issue that it is now. So it's still the question of what are what are our roles in this when the policymakers and some of the folks who are pulling the strings on this are saying that's not really. And I'm thinking about um, Christine, what you were saying about your editors who are saying this isn't really something that we want to keep talking about. But we all know that it's a situation that's dire, and getting more dire. And then. Uh, Third and final question. I also want to say thank you as well. So my question is, do you um, have any feelings about Ford buying the train station in Corktown? And um, what that could mean for the residents that you know are already in that area? And then also any advice for any organizations that are in that area, like nonprofit organizations in that area, and what they can do to help those residents um, as they try to figure out their next move with Ford. Okay, so I'll, I'll summarize these three back as best I can, just to refresh, and you can grab which one uh, any of you want. So one, the first question was about an effort on outreach and targeting the the individuals that these kind of predatory contracts or, or people, basically contract dealers, are trying to, to get into houses. So are there any efforts you're aware of there? Um, the second is what are our roles in this, right? In particular, but thinking about the right of first, the right of first refusal, um, the need to kind of fill in the gap of a lack of um, city or government effort, and then and also an unwillingness to kind of deal 
with questions of speculation and real estate activity by the city and the land bank. Uh, and then last one, um, you, the Ford train station in particular, but I think it's a kind of a, 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 also a deeper question about gentrification, neighborhood change, and what happens to residents when, when major investments come to a neighborhood, and what can nonprofits, community groups do about it? So. Were yes, about those the were the station. three questions. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good summary of the three questions, Josh. Thanks. <laughs> so on the first the question station? about, you know, how to preemptively <laughs> warn people in communities against signing these contracts, um, I can't tell you or cities around the country how many conversations I have with organizers in which I say, look, as you know, this could be a problem in your community. And they say, no, not here in blank city, Oakland or whatever. And then while they're talking to me, they do this Google thing about, you know, land contracts or rent to own. And all of a sudden the internet breaks. I mean, it's like 50 companies will come out in Oakland that are advertising, you know, rent to own, no down pay, you know, whatever. Um, and that's the problem. Almost all the marketing and telemarketing is, you know, via the internet and it's not, they don't have a physical office like you used to have to where you could target as an organizer, at least with a base, you could target that company, you could, you know, put flyers out and, you know, so it's very difficult to preemptively do it. And, and on the backside, um, trying to determine who's actually on those contracts so that you can go out and visit them, which is what we've done to build this campaign. Uh, and we've had help from Josh and Eric on this, but it's, uh, uh, it's very difficult in some cases to, to do that as well. So your point is excellent, but the solution still is, is evasive. Uh, do you well, want to I think, I mean, I think the lawsuit yeah, against, uh, uh, Detroit Property Exchange uh, has just been filed um, uh, by some nonprofit groups, and so I think that's one way, you know, word is going to get out. But I mean, there are definitely holes. I don't see. I don't know anybody that's that out there that's um, has a list or who's who's saying these are the bad guys. You know, stay away from those folks. But because my my story on Mike Kelly is not even online anymore. Like it our, on, our well, it's on your well yeah, but it's, it's but, you know a lot of the stuff that we've written uh, for whatever reasons at the news in our website, you know, some of the stuff isn't out there. And I don't think there's a, unless I, I got. Well, I, no, Provision Property Management had 28 different LLCs that right, you had yeah. to track. Yeah. So, yeah. and that only came out, you know, because of no, discoveries right. that we found in Wisconsin. And, yeah. you know, so it's, it's, you know, it's random how you even track down. So if you were just looking for one, you know, one company, Vision Property Management, which is their main operating, you, you'd only find a, a piece of the, one, so I'll tell, oh, it, go one on. other quick thing is that um, Sarah Alvarez, she is with this uh, Outlier Media. It's in Detroit. It's really good. Check it out. She does really great work on this topic too. But she's she got she used FOIA for the treasurer's office and requested their list. They said they do have a or in the rules that said you could be banned from the sale. If, you know, with these things like uh, back property taxes or buying back your property. Uh, so she FOIA the list. There's nobody on it. There's nobody. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, that's I'll, I'll just throw I'll I'll just throw it in there real real quickly. Yeah. So, their um, Detroit eviction events is a mutual aid organization. They've been operating for six years now. They actually have a list. Uh, we work with them quite a bit. We give them a long list of different speculators and the shell companies that they use. Uh, they create a newsletter. They also have flyers. They do direct outreach to communities that are targeted. Uh, we work with them and neighborhood organizations that are interested in trying to stabilize their neighborhood. We build them maps. They do door-to-door -door knocking and outreach and put and hold legal service clinics uh, for people that are facing it to try and educate them about it. It's, it's piecemeal and it's volunteer work, but um, there, is a, there is an effort to kind of systematize and get that out. Um, Quite broadly, so. well, when we, these are the institutions that control so many properties, and there's so few alternatives. It's a, yeah, it can be hard to discourage people from taking up. Well, it's much like Wade said, right? It's a pricing mechanism too. Like they're often smart enough to price below below market to get you in. So we had two more. Did anyone? Else? Yeah, I think. Well, I actually think your question can kind of tie to your question because you were asking about the early, like, wh why wasn't an article written 
not about the program, but to help people be informed about the program. And I think that that's a, f a failing on. We did. But yeah, you, you did a failing on my part. But it doesn't get as my, you know. It doesn't get as much traction, right? Um, yeah, or attention. Yeah, and I think that that's something I definitely, a, a, you know. Uh, the year prior, as Christine was kind of yeah. talking about disinterest in newsrooms about the auction, um, I think in 2017 we had heard UCHC was like had lost uh, they a significant number of homes that they were bidding on, and you know e this is even delayed. But you know, pitching that to my editor, she was like, "That happens every year. What's the story?" <laughs> um, and so it's really disheartening. But I I do think we can do better and I think we're starting to try to do better in terms of writing about some of these programs and, and being more kind of um, public service journalism yeah. so people can so it's not just about the story but also how people can get a poverty tax exemption um, or be if find out if they're qualified or not but it's definitely something I think I I'm aware of as being a definite problem on on the role of the media, and we could do better. So I appreciate you bringing that up and asking that. Um, and I think in terms of your question, it's same thing, we could probably do a better job of write, writing about who, even though as we pointed out, there's so many LLCs associated with all these people, it'd be really difficult, but we could do a better job. And so I, I appreciate both of you guys bringing that up, because those are failings on our part. Um, on my part. I'm no, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, our instructions to be more positive, I don't even want to mention what the percentage of low to moderate income people are who actually would read one of these newspapers if they ran the story every day. It's, I mean, that's, but I want to be positive. Well, right? yeah. and <laughs> if you're interested in that topic, this, that's uh, Sarah Alvarez's model, yeah. an outlier, so. Um, yeah, that's, that's reach, worth checking yeah, out. Yeah. Yep. I made a note on that. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Does anyone want to briefly Tell her you sent me there. address <laughs> gentrification in the train station? Um, I mean, I have written about the train station. I, I think something that, so not exactly the train station, but I wrote recently about um, a hotel downtown that uh, had given out these eviction notices, giving people 30 days mm -hmm. uh, as they were kind of about to um, solidify a sale of the building. Um, and the city really promptly, as soon as that was announced, like mobilized funds, I think it was like $400,000 was allocated to helping the people in this building. And I think a lot of it, there was a lot of um, response that was positive in the sense that this is good. Um, but at the same time, there was a lot of critique that I think was valid in terms of the fact that that's one building um, and helping the people in that one building that doesn't actually that's not actually an answer in terms of affordable housing and at the end of the day the people who live there they now have till June to find new housing they're likely not going to be able to find affordable housing in the downtown area that they were in before um, so I don't know what the answer is but I think definitely uh, it would be naive to say that gentrification, um, or it would be naive to say that there that prices will not go up um, around the train station. And I think making sure that affordability is an option is important. I feel like that. I've <laughs> I think there is one. Ford bought the train station. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ford bought the train I mean, station. Gentrification is a problem everywhere in the country, and I don't need to tell you that. I mean. It is an advantage if you have a clear target like Ford, as in terms of your organizations on the ground. And what you might want to do is look at the campaign we ran here against GM on the new center complex back in the 70s. Now, it did make an enemy of Coleman Young forever, um, may rest in peace. But the whole issue for in that campaign was trying to get GM to pay relocation cost and, and you know, affordable and subsidies to people to be able to move in that sense who were in the same situation except 40 years ago. Um, we won some, we lost some, um, and, but it was a very extensive and bitter campaign. And uh, 
as Christine said, you can get my card later, and I'll, I'll give you some more details about where you can go. But that was, you know, in prehistoric time back last century. Uh, but it is still the same process, and it's, uh, it's nice to have a big target because uh, most of the targets of gentrification around the country now, you're, you know, fighting marshmallows with, mm -hmm. you know, straws, and it's a terrible situation. So uh, moving from prehistoric time to contemporary time, right. I want to thank all of you for uh, agreeing to come out and participate uh, in this discussion. Um, and thank you to all of you for coming as well.